Hello everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith and I am excited to be doing a solo setup for Eon's End, War Eternal. Now you'll notice here below it, I have Eon's End, the board game, the core game from Indie Boards and Cards Action Phase Games. Now this is the original Eon's End and I wanna say Aeon so much inside, but the A is silent in this case. I looked up the pronunciation and it's actually Eon's N. So you almost have to pretend the A is not even there in order to pronounce it correctly, which always messes with my head. So I may even pronounce it correctly going, or incorrectly going forward, so please forgive me. Um, but essentially, uh, Eon's End, the core game is this one right here. This was the original one that came out. It was a Kickstarter back in the day and was a successful one. And there's a lot of people that really, really enjoyed this deck builder. Um, so this is the one that I'm gonna be covering in this video for setup. We're gonna be talking about the most recent iteration of uh, Eon's End, uh, which is War Eternal. So this is another standalone game separate from the original base one. So both of these can be played individually or mix and matched. Um, it's a game by Kevin Riley, and I'm really excited for this. So I hope you'll join me as we jump into the solo setup of Eon's End. Now the first thing I want to do before we jump into that setup is just give you an idea of the objective of the game. So basically the game itself is a cooperative deck builder where your deck is never shuffled. Interesting, right? Your goal is to defeat the nemesis before your home grave hold is overrun or the players are exhausted. Each round, the players and nemesis will take turns in random order. During a player's turn, they will be able to cast spells, acquire additional gems, relics, and spells from the supply, manipulate their spell casting breaches, and use their unique abilities. All four of the different nemesis included in the game are unique in the actions taken during their turns and will require a different strategy to be defeated. So the whole purpose essentially is you're going through with a number of different uh, mages basically and you're casting spells and opening breaches and you're trying to take down these nemesis as they attack the city of Gravehold as you're trying to essentially hold out. So things have gone south and essentially you're holding this Gravehold area down as it's being attacked continuously. There's a couple different ways to lose the game. We'll talk about that in the rules overview video, which will follow this one. But starting right now, we're going to start doing the solo setup for Eon's End War Eternal. All right, so the very first thing you're going to want to do when you're setting up for Aeon's End is get yourself a cool player mat, which I did. I picked one up at my local game store. I just thought it is cool to add some theme to a deck builder or a card game of any type. So instead of looking at a table that's just black or just gray, why don't you go ahead and grab a player mat? It'll add so much atmosphere to your playing experience. Now, that's not part of the setup, but I highly recommend you do so. Now, in terms of the player setup for this game, there's a number of different ways you can set this game up depending on how you want to play. If you're playing solo, you can play all four mages and try to actually uh, basically handle all of them at the same time, which is a lot to handle. Uh, or you can actually go ahead and just choose to do two, for instance, or one. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and actually choose to use two, and we're going to move forward with that. So the very first thing you're going to do, essentially, is pick your number of players you're playing. When you're playing solo, I'm picking two. You're going to take a player mat for each of the different types of uh, characters that you can be and so we're going to go through those right now. All right, so when you first lay out all the characters that you can potentially be in this game, you're going to notice there's a total of eight of them. So you're going to go ahead and pick. Now, when you're first choosing, there's a number of different things or reasons as to why you may choose a particular character over another. But when you're first starting out, it doesn't hurt to just grab two and run. Uh, just to get a good feeling of the game, it's not going to hurt you to just grab two and continue on. Uh, as you play through the game and get more comfortable with it, you'll find out which ones or which characters bounce off each other better, have better synergies, that type of thing thing. For this particular playthrough for myself, I'm going to choose to use Yan. Uh, Yan is a enlightened exile. And then Maza, I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce his name correctly. Uh, he is a henge mystic. So these are the two that I'm going to choose to use in this particular uh, playthrough or solo playthrough and the rest of them are going to go back to the box. All right, so now we got our characters set up on the playmat. I'm also going to go ahead and grab the starting player number tokens. So again, if you're only playing with two characters, it's as simple as grabbing a one and a two. If you're playing with four, you're going to have one, two, three, four. You essentially take the number one for whichever one you want to be uh, uh, noted as player number one and go into the player number slot on the board and just drop it down like that. Same thing over here. I choose that this player is player number two. You'll see that when we actually get to the gameplay, it doesn't matter which one you pick as player one or two, it all ends up coming down to a turn order deck when we get going. 
The next step is that each player is going to build their starting hand and deck as shown on their player mat. So you're going to notice on Yan's player mat there's a starting hand as well as a starting deck area here. So starting deck is what we're focusing on. Everything that's noted to the left is what is going to be on the top of the deck and everything noted further down will be on the bottom. So you're building it left to right. So for instance in this particular case we have four crystals and one spark. So the deck would essentially be built like this so that when your deck is flipped over over, the crystals are on top and the spark is on the bottom just like in order from left to right here so this is going to be the starting deck without shuffling of yen so we can go ahead and place this on the left side of the player mat which is basically right denoted on the player board there it says deck and there we go we've got the starting deck created now another thing to note about these cards I'm creating and using right now is that each of them have a symbol in the bottom right hand corner that is an S and that's going to denote that it's a starter card or a starting card and those are the cards you're going to be going after whether it be a relic, gem or spell. Uh, no matter what it is for these starting cards look for those S's and divide them up in piles so that it's more easy or it's easier I should say for you guys to actually find uh, which cards that your particular character is asking you to build its deck on. So in this case uh, Maz here has another one that's starting deck of four crystals and one spark so again using the exact same layout as Yan, we're going to have four crystals in a row and then spark on the bottom. So really I can just merge all these together in a pile, we're not shuffling anything, spark is going to go on the bottom, it's going to get flipped over, and then it's going to land itself right to the left of the player board, and that is setting up the decks. The next step in the setup is each player is going to receive one of each type of breach shown on their mat, so one to four in Roman numerals as listed. Players are going to arrange their breaches as indicated on their player mat. Some breach images will start with fewer than four, but typically the fewer the breaches a mage has, the more difficult they are to play. In this particular case, we have ma uh, mages that basically have all of their breaches available to them, and you can see that because of the actual symbolism up in the top of the player board. If there happened to be an X or they weren't there, then you're not getting those breaches. So we have a pile of breaches right here, and you'll see they're marked Roman numeral one down to four four. You simply, now again, you got to make sure that you don't actually put these in open position to start because that's what you're essentially building up to as you play through the game is to open up your breaches to cause damage and to allow for spells to be cast. So you're going to start your game by taking a look at the symbols on your player board. If you see something that's a full circle like that, that means the breach is open. It's a full circle. So this would sit like so. And you'll notice that it's right on the edge in a weird kind of cut corner. That's because it wants you to kind of set it just a little bit off from the main player board because one will go here, two, then three, and then four. The second one won't be in the open position. As you can see here, we're going to follow for Roman numeral number two, we're going to follow this particular pattern where the arrow basically ends on the left side. So we're going to flip this over, we're going to find the arrow, there it is, and we've got to rotate it so that it matches that particular icon. There we go then this is going to lay like so. You'll see more in the rules overview why that is and how this basically opens up. But essentially what this is going to do basically is be rotated throughout the gameplay and allow you to eventually open it completely like this first one here. So again, you continue in the same vein with these other ones. So the third Roman numeral is going to match up with the exact same uh, situation down below. And this one actually works perfectly just like this. Then you're going to grab the fourth one and you're going to follow the symbol again and set it and you're done. So you've got all your breaches for Maz set up perfectly. You're going to do the exact same thing with Yan now. So Yan again is going to have an open breach here. Then Yan is going to have one closed breach in this position. Then a third is going to be in this position and finally the fourth is going to be in this position and all of your breaches are now set up for your two mages. Next step is that each player is going to start the game with 10 life, so set the Gravehold life dial to 30 and the players in Gravehold can never have more than their starting life. So we have the life area on each of the player boards. So we're gonna take some blood drops basically to represent uh, life. Now I could put one 10 or two fives, but I've chosen to break it down so that we have uh, the availability to take damage, although I'm sure we're not gonna to want to do that during gameplay. Uh, we gotta make sure that that adds up to five and then we're good to go. So there we go, there's 10 health on Maz coming over to Yan. We're gonna be grabbing a five to put in the life spot as 
well as the other five smaller ones around it to make a total of 10. Once those are in position, then you are good to go. Now, the other thing that we have to set up right now is grave hold. So grave hold actually is a dial. So it looks like this. Um, now, originally, I should say it's like this. So we got two and they're set to zero. We're gonna wanna set grave hold to 30 to start the game. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna put this actually up on the track up here and we're gonna rotate this until we get it to 30. And there we go. So we've got that set to 30. As you can see, Grave Hold the Town actually has an image on the actual dial itself to give you an idea of the city. It also keeps it thematic. I like it quite a bit. But once you've got that in position, you're all set to go for this particular step. Next step is to build the turn order deck. Now the turn order deck is always comprised of four player turn order cards and two nemesis turn order cards. So you can see here I've taken out two ones, two twos, and two nemesis because again, in total, we have to have four player cards. So by playing two characters, we need to have four cards. So you take two from each. Now if we were playing with four different mages, um, then essentially we'd be removing a one, removing a two, and replacing with a three and a four so that we'd have one, two, three, four, and two Nemesis cards. The turn order deck is always built in this way and again, changes and scales based on the number of characters that you're playing. The turn order deck is also shuffled and then placed in the appropriate spot. So in this case, I will shuffle off camera, but basically we're gonna go ahead, merge these decks together. They're gonna to be given a shuffle and then they're going to be located off to the side. So the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is uh, choose which nemesis that you wanna go up against. And there's gonna be a number of them in the War Eternal box. There's up to four. Uh, I've got three here in front of me and we're actually, just as an example, there's a couple of them there, or a few of them I should say. And in the back, we're actually gonna go ahead and face off against this individual here who looks absolutely pleasant. Uh, the Umbra Titan, it looks Kind of devastating to be honest. Um, we're gonna go ahead and set this up right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be placing this up here, which is gonna cover a little bit of the box, but it's gonna make sure that it's always visible while we're playing through. Next up, we're gonna grab the life dial for the nemesis that we're going after, and it looks just like this. And you're gonna to wanna to set it so that it's equal to the exact same life points that your actual uh, nemesis is listed as, in this case, 70. So you just turn that dial until it hits and matches that particular life point, and then put this off to the side for reference as well. So as you can see now, we have grave hold over here and the nemesis life over on the opposite side. I am, for those of you wondering what this thing is, if you've never seen it before, I've created this using uh, Uber Stacks. That's what it's called if you're curious. Uh, you can check out a future product video on my, uh, my, on my channel if you want to know more about the product itself, but I find it fantastic for giving uh, solo players a place to set up and modify. You'll see how cool this really looks and how much it gets things off the table and also keeps them facing towards you. But that's besides the point, but anyway, this is going to be left at 70, Grave Holds at 30, and we're moving on. Now that we've got our Nemesis selected, let's go ahead and build the Nemesis deck. So in front of me here, I've got a set of nine Nemesis-specific cards for the one we've chosen. The individual we've chosen is the Umbra Titan, as you can see from right here. And we're gonna make sure that the cards that we find match the same title down in the bottom banner here of this particular card. So there should be nine of them total. And also you'll notice that there are numbers along the bottom right of those cards. There should be three ones, three twos, and three threes for each nemesis in the game. You're gonna make sure that you have all nine of those cards. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna separate those cards into, into different decks. So essentially you're gonna have three ones together, three twos, and three threes in a moment I will separate those out. Over here we have what are considered basic nemesis cards. They're also going to be merged into the nemesis deck to basically add randomization to it. So these have a one right here for tier one. They have a two if they're tier two and then they have a three if they're tier three. Now these cards can comprise themselves of minions, they can comprise themselves of powers, there's attack cards, there's all kinds of different things that can possibly show up, but basically they're gonna throw a wrench into what you assume the nemesis is gonna do. So if you play the game multiple times, the nemesis will change its tactics against you. So let's go ahead and start building the nemesis deck right now. So as you can see right here, the basic Nemesis cards that are basically gonna be added to the Nemesis cards that are specific to the Nemesis that you're playing against are gonna be shown here. So if you're playing a two-player game, you're gonna be taking three tier one cards, 
and you're gonna be taking five tier two cards and seven tier three cards and mixing them in with the nemesis specific cards. So let's show you kind of how that's gonna work. So if we come back over here, you're gonna see the three different ones now broken out. Again, the bottom of each of these are the Umbra Titan. And again, this is one, two, and three. There's three cards of each right here. Now that doesn't follow the chart I just showed you. This is just how every nemesis already has nine cards available to it. Right here are the basic cards, and that chart refers to these cards entering that deck. So, it said for two player that tier one, there would be three additional cards. So what we'd be doing is essentially flipping this over and randomizing, shuffling, that type of thing, until you find three cards to add to that deck. You'd be then going to this particular one, which is the uh, second tier, flipping it over, doing the exact same thing, going through it and finding five cards on this one, and then finally, going to the last tier where you would be looking for seven cards to add to the deck and again so three from here which would land right here five from here landing here and finally seven from there landing here and then you'd shuffle them up per, per deck per tier but not together and then you layer them with the ones on top, then the twos, then the threes, and then you do not shuffle and you finalize your deck. So I'm gonna do that now off camera. I'm basically gonna grab three cards here, five and seven, put them into their respective tiers, and then I'm going to put the one tier on top, second tier on the bottom, third tier on the on the bottom of that, and then put it up in the top left-hand corner of this player mat. Okay, so off camera, I've gone ahead and I've taken three cards from tier number one, basic nemesis deck and added them into this, shuffled them up as well. I've added five from the tier two basic nemesis deck and added them to this two, tier two deck and shuffled them up. And then I took seven from the tier three and added them to this nemesis tier three deck and shuffled them up. Now at this point, you're gonna have six decks in front of you. You no longer need the basic nemesis decks. And you'll notice from the last uh, skip of video there that I flipped these over so that I wouldn't know what actually was going into these decks. Then you don't need these ones anymore because these are the basic cards. So you can go ahead and put those ones back in the box and there's dividers provided throughout the game in order to house that. So now you've got your three decks in a row, you're not going to shuffle them, you're just going to simply place one tier on top of the second tier, and the second tier on top of the third tier, and just like that you've created your Nemesis deck, and you can place it wherever you want. Next up for the Nemesis, you want to go ahead and flip the card over on its back because there will be some setup instructions behind it. So you'll see here there is a setup section and it'll say Umbra Titan gains 8 Nemesis tokens. So that is the norm of how to play this Nemesis. However, if you wanted to increase the difficulty when you start beating it or become better, you can also start it with 5 Nemesis tokens. And we'll talk more about what those are and how they work exactly, or more so how they work in the Rules Overview video. But we are going to set them up in advance. You can set that at five if you want increased difficulty, but we definitely don't want that. We'll go with eight for this particular playthrough. So normally the tokens that are Nemesis tokens come in the box just like this. However, I've got some black gems that I'm going to use instead to represent the Nemesis tokens. And I believe I have all the ones I need right here. So I'm going to go ahead and put them up here so that we can easily see them. This is kind of why I put this tray here so that as we go through that there's no confusion as to how many Nemesis tokens are still available uh, so basically we have eight gems here once these disappear bad things happen uh, so these tokens are going to remove these are the ones that come in again in the box but I'm just not choosing not to use them they're perfectly fine but I choose to use the gems instead now we've got our nemesis all set up ready to go Moving on to the next step is to build the starting supplies. So you have a couple actual suggested supplies that you can set up that the rule book makes note of right here. One is called the deck destruction supply or the reuse spell supply. You can go ahead and use these or there's also randomizers and cards which allow for different uh, deck building elements and outcomes really in the supply deck. So it's really cool. Uh, you can actually go through these cards essentially. So this is actually following the deck destruction build. So this is basically going to give you a 3x3 three three grid of a mix of a number of gems. There is uh, three gems here, two relics, and four spells. That's the norm. So normally when placing or, or making a supply, you're going to have your three gems, two relics, and four spells. Uh, but there is randomizer cards as well as even spell or supply setup cards that allow for 
different variations of that. You can have less or more gems, you can have more relics or less relics, or more sp spells or less spells. It's up to you in those cases. So I'm going to follow what's suggested to start, and of course as I gain more experience and as we gain more experience, we can choose to change the supply in future games. So this is exactly what I'm going to be building, and I'll be building this out, and you basically take all of the cards that pertain uh, to this particular gem and pull them out. Same with each of these. And you'll find these gems, their values in terms of their cost is in the top right corner and stuff like that. So you grab all of them for all nine of these. And again, they're all listed right here. So we're gonna see this entire thing built right to the right of my player mat in a few seconds. And just like that, the uh, supply has been set up. Now, each of these decks are going to be different, obviously, based on the text as well as the art that's there. Underneath them, count-wise, you may have some that have more than others. Don't worry about that. Just find every single card that is like the other and put them in these decks. Um, so again, certain ones will have higher number, others have less. Don't worry about that. Like I said, just get them into their decks and you're ready to go. Again, we've got a mix of gems, so one, two, three gems, two relics, and four spells. Now, we're also, in order to finish off the setup, going to bring some tokens into play. So there's a few tokens. First, we're going to start off with some dice. These dice are going to be great for keeping count of damage on minions. Now, you don't have to use 10-sided uh, dice, but I'm going to. Uh, you can also use the damage tokens that come in the game that you use for your characters as well. Um, but I find that 10-sided dice are actually even better. So, uh, even though we put 10 health on our characters... I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to remove this health right now and we're going to replace it with a 10 sided die uh, for each of them because I just think it's going to be easier to keep track of and we can just rotate this as we go. Again, as minions come out of the Nemesis deck and they land right here, we'll use 10 sided dice in order to note how much health is on them. So for now, just keep them somewhere close by. And again, if you don't have those, you're completely fine with using just the regular damage tokens that come in the box. Next up, of course, we've got the charge tokens. Now, these tokens look like this when they come in the game box themselves. And these charge tokens, essentially, using Ether, which we'll talk more about in the rules overview, can be used to charge up to gain a special ability. So you basically fill up your charges to gain that special ability using these tokens. However, instead of using these tokens, which come in the game box, I'm going to go ahead and use some nice blue gems, which will be a lot more thematic. So we'll just put those up here. And again, depending on whichever tokens you have just make sure they're in arm's reach that's really what matters most lastly we've got the generic time counters which i'm going to use uh, these right here for and they're essentially going to be used for things like power cards which will also come out of the nemesis deck and maybe decreasing or increasing over other turns so we're going to go ahead and put those over here and they're all within arm's reach and just like that we've got this thing set up so guys, in the next episode, we're going to run into the rules overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the characters work, the breaches work, the, the decks, how they are managed, how they're played, uh, how a turn order goes through from start to finish, a little bit more about Gravehold and the Nemesis, as well as the Nemesis deck. And we'll talk a little bit about strategy uh, or at a high level in terms of what we want to go after in order to increase um, our deck and make it stronger per player. We'll also talk about our special character abilities and whatever story or any information that comes specific from the Nemesis card. So hopefully you guys will join me. Thanks so much for watching this setup and hope it was useful for you. And I'll see you in the next video, the Rules Over video. As always, everyone, keep on rolling solo.